sorry for the little intro. That's okay. Uh, my name is Sarah Calise. I'm at the Albergo Research Center interviewing Dr. Michael McDonald. The date is March 22nd, 2018. And we're here to talk about his childhood and his time at NTSU. All right. When and where were you born? I was born uh, August 13th, 1956, in Buffalo, Erie County, New York, the United States of America. Fell on a Tuesday. Oh, wow. <laughs> really specific. Okay. Yeah. What are your parents' names? My father's name was Ned uh, McDonald, and my mom's name was Margaret Catherine McDonald. Her maiden name, last name was Hafford, like the Heifer call. Okay. Yeah, and they both grew up in... Uh, and uh, were born in northern Alabama. My mom was born in Normal, Alabama, which is where Alabama A&M is at. My dad was born in a place called Chelsea. And uh, Chelsea is the uh, southernmost part of Huntsville, and northern is pretty much the northernmost part, so I'm not really sure how they met. <laughs> I do know, but, but yeah, they were born opposite ends of Madison County. Okay, what did they do for a living? My dad um, was a bailer. Uh, he had a sixth grade education, and he dropped out of school to help um, my grandmother um, in terms of the, the farm that they had. Uh, and um, after he and my mom married, which was in 1952, I think it was 51 or 52 in, Hunt, in Huntsville, packed on Christmas Day uh, wow. in 1951, 52, um, they made the decision to follow my dad's sister and her husband, who was a Korean War veteran to Buffalo. They were all part of the Great Migration. That's how I ended up being born in New York and Alabama. I'm actually, I'm actually uh, an offspring of one of the mi millions of children that were born as a result of the Great Migration. Yeah. My mom was a teacher, uh, and um, they both were very, very smart. My dad was very street, street savvy. My mom was very book savvy, and we used to call her Judge Judy because she was so witty with her wisdom. Um, and so my mom taught school, and then she took the position at one point to, to go to um, teach at a daycare center in a church so that she could do that and then raise us. Mm -hmm. um, so my dad was a blue-collar worker. Uh, and the place we worked was called F.N. Burr Company in Buffalo. It was a um, paper plant. At one point, it was the largest paper plant company in the world. Uh, they manufactured boxes for everything from Avon to for General Mills cereals. He used to come home all the time with boxes for, for us, you know, to use for different things. Uh, and then he became he came involved with the union. Okay. So, um, as you're going to see, kind of their influences in me in terms of union activity and. Um, just union rights and uh, very populous. Both of them were very populous when it came to, you know, their view about things. But and then, like I said, my dad got involved with the machinist union, um, and I mentioned he had a sixth grade education. He couldn't read very well, but he always got this this uh, newsletter in the mail, and I can remember him coming to me and asking me to read it, to tell him what was going on. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay in Buffalo? Oh, uh, actually, there were stints there. Okay. Um, I was there from the time I was born, which was 56, to roughly 1962, I believe it was, mm -hmm. shortly after President Kennedy was assassinated. And in fact, my dad had taken me to see him in Buffalo. Oh, really? I was like probably four or five years old. And I actually saw, I don't, it was so many people there. Yeah. I just remember being on my dad's shoulder and just going to going to LaSalle Park, which is a very big park in, 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 in Buffalo, and seeing the president. And like a year or two later, he was assassinated. We moved back to Huntsville in 62, uh, and that had less to do with, you know, the civil rights and, and more to do with domestic violence that was very prevalent mm. in, um, in my family. Uh, and so my mom had made a decision to come back to Huntsville. And then uh, we stayed there for, I think, a year, year and a half. 
and then came back to Buffalo in 65, I believe it was. Yeah, 65. And then stayed there until 72. 72 was really uh, considered to me like a pinnacle timeline as far as changing the course of everything in my life. We, we, we call that cross in the Red Sea. My mom wrote a book, in fact, called that. Really? Yeah, because of of everything that was happening between 65 and 72 and the domestic violence, the street violence. And um, and my mom just literally asked me and my younger siblings, um, you know, did you want to stay in New York or do you want to go back to Huntsville? My oldest brother was in Vietnam Mm. at the time. And so... um, I said, yeah, I mean, it'd be kind of sad losing all my friends. You know, I just I had just started at a, a private school and one of the few African-Americans there. Mm-hmm. And um, it's called Nichols School, by the way, okay. Nichols. Nichols. And so um, to me, it was a tough decision. But I said, well, you know, things are really tough for us at home. And, you know, I'm tired of seeing my mom get beat on. And my mom took the position that you guys are getting bigger. You're not going to take this. And she was right. Mm-hmm. So it was more about her saving my dad. I know it sounds strange, saving my dad, than it was um, um, saving us. I was torn about it uh, because um, in 1964, I was probably six years old, I was sexually assaulted uh-huh. by a kid. And so I was really tormented about going back. I wasn't really, and it was the kind of thing that you didn't talk about back then. In Huntsville, this happened. It happened in so Huntsville. You didn't want to go back. Yeah, I did not want to go back, um, and it, it was just one of those places. It was almost like going back to the scene of a crime, right? In some respects, but then in other respects, it was like, you know, you know, I'm older now, and maybe this is what, maybe this is what happens to people. Maybe it's not just me. And so I just kind of put that in the back of my head and said, you know, mind whatever you want us to do. And so I, we literally packed items while my dad was at work. He would come home and have no clue yeah. that this mission was in progress. We actually left on a Greyhound bus in the middle of the night. He was working a night shift. And when he came home, we were gone. Right. So, and so we stayed in Huntsville. Well, I stayed in Huntsville you know, for my junior and senior year, and then I ended up here at MTSU, which is, oh, that to me is the other, if if uh, going from Buffalo to Huntsville is crossing the Red Sea, then going from Huntsville to Murfreesboro, maybe it's like crossing Mount Everest, yeah. as you'll see. So what high school did you go to in Huntsville? I went to S.R. Butler High, Samuel Roy Butler High School, um, and I understand that, um, General Butler was a high-ranking officer in the Confederacy. Again, something else. You talk about an awakening, having grown up in New York and coming to to Alabama, you know. And and our mascot was a a rebel. And I played basketball and football, and in all the games, you see this sea of rebel flags in the stands or in the stadium. And there were a handful of African-American athletes on the team, and they all grew up in this I didn't so f- for me maybe I was a bit desensitized about it but I learned it very quickly I learned what these emblems and flags and models were all about because I'd seen it to some degree up north but it wasn't related to um, the rebel flag or the confederacy up north it was more related to um, just I guess we would call it just pockets of ethnicity in terms of cultures. There were certain neighborhoods in Buffalo that you just would not go to if you're African-American. It had nothing to do with Confederacy, it had to do with race. And in some respects, you know, in retrospect, I think the North really, um, in terms of race relations, um, hasn't embraced and confronted a lot of the issues. Whereas in the South, it's in your face. It's, I mean, you know, it's hard not to see it. And therefore, there's a greater tendency to 
try to address it, even if people don't. Mm -hmm. There's this awareness that it's there. Right. So, um, and we actually played Oakland High School. My senior year, that's how I learned about MTSU. Okay. So beyond that, I had no clue about what it was about. And then one of our special teams coach, and I played special teams, he went to MTSU. His name was Ray Stillman. He graduated in 1968. Pivotal year. Right, and again, that's what I'm saying. There, there's, there's, there's underpinnings and just links and connections and, and all of this, but that's why I thought it was kind of powerful doing this today. But he graduated in 68. He uh, worked at State Farm while he was here. And um, um, my senior year, I had applied to several schools. I've been accepted in, you know, a couple schools back up north. I was looking at going to Colgate or Cornell or Niagara University. Um, um, those were three schools I always wanted to go to mm -hmm. um, and have been accepted. Uh, and then I just on a whim applied to MTSU. And for some reason, MTSU just kind of, kind of like yeast, it rolls to the top for some reason in terms of my interest. Uh, and part of it had to do with me having visited the campus as a senior and my coach, whereas with, you know, Cornell and Colgate and, and Niagara, I'd seen those schools, you know, I'd seen them in catalogs, but I actually had experienced in tissue come right. here. And we played Oakland here on this campus. So playing a high school game mm -hmm. on a collegiate field was, it was kind of impressive. Yeah. So, and we didn't, I didn't see any of the, you know, the rebel flags. I knew that we were here. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I graduated from Butler High in '74, and don't let me get ahead of you if I am. Mm -hmm. Let me know, um, and got my letter of acceptance from all those schools, including MTSU, and made a decision I was going to go to middle. And so, probably a week or two before I was supposed to be here for freshman orientation, which would have been probably. August of 74, mm -hmm. I get a letter from financial aid uh, basically saying that I have to come up with four or $5,000 because I was an out-of-state resident. Right. And so I recall very vividly um, me just explaining to my mom the situation and her crying. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she said, I am so sorry, I don't have this money. I said, Mom, I never would expect you to do this. And this is, you know, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And so, you know, we prayed about it, and I told her, I said, well, I'm going to get a job. So I got a job working for the city of Huntsville Parks and Recreation, basically as a garbage man. Yeah. Literally, I am, I'm not making this up. I used to ride around picking up trash in the parks in the city of Huntsville. And then we also um, re um, repaint the baseball diamonds uh, and change the lights up in these cherry pickers. You know what a cherry picker is? Yeah. I've never been up in one before, and that was my first time. And, of course, it's bumping up and down, and everything's like, man, this thing's going to blow up our <laughs> But anyway, I had that job during the day. And then I had a, a job in a bookstore in one of the strip malls in Huntsville that night. So I was moonlighting. This one particular night, Coach Stillman comes in with his wife. And he sees me and he says, you're supposed to be up in Murfreesboro. I said, yeah, I know, but, and then I told him what I just shared with you. Yeah. He says, well, you're not gonna believe this, he says, but you know, I worked at State Farm when I was at MTSU. And um, I know the personnel director, they didn't use HR back then, the personnel director. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I just spoke with him. And I also, uh, the recruiter, chief recruiter, her name was, his name was Jim Hill, and her name was Jean Hiley. And so he said, I just spoke to both. and. They're expanding their office. They're giving it the change their data processing 
um, equipment or computer system going from a Honeywell to an IBM. I remember very clearly, Honeywell mm -hmm. to IBM. And um, he says they're in a, they got four people that work in that division at State Farm. Uh, and they're gonna need a fifth person, fifth person to run what's called a bursting machine or burster. Uh, what a burster does is that you have all these forms like your insurance renewal form or cancellation form. It's all on, you know, all on, on perforated paper uh -huh. on big rolls and it comes off the machine, you know, in big rolls. And so you have a machine that perforates and separates okay. the forms and, but you have to ask somebody to operate it. Long story short, <laughs> I get on a bus from Huntsville to Murfreesboro and I arrive here like about 12 o'clock at night. Never been to downtown Murfreesboro before. So I just, and I got a, a suitcase and, and just the clothes on my back. And I think at that point I had $10 to my name. So I just start walking in the general direction of the campus. Well, this Murfreesboro police officer sees me. And, um, and I tell him who I am, tell him where I'm from and why I'm here. So he says, okay, he says, he says, get in the car. And it wasn't confrontational. Mm -hmm. Let me just settle that. Not this time. And so I get in the car, the front seat, not the back seat, the front seat. Mm -hmm. He takes me to, I guess, what used to be the Murfreesboro Hotel. We're out of abroad. He goes in and sees the night clerk. Um, and he comes back out, he says, he says, give her $5. And they put me up for the night for five dollars. The next morning, I call Jean Hiley. She comes picks me up. We have breakfast at Sony's. I tour State Farm, which used to be on Broad Street. Okay. Uh, it's not where it is now. Memorial. And so, we go to State Farm, see the data processing office, and meet the director. His name was Kenny Mayfield. Then they take me over to MTSU, to the admissions office. I meet one of the recruiters, John Todd, and um, again, it's Gene's with me. And so we're explaining what the situation is. Um, and so he says, well, if you get a full-time job here in Murfreesboro and you um, work full-time for a year, then you can come here and go part-time for a year. At the end of that year, you'll be an interstate student for residency purposes. So I got the job, I got, had already been accepted at MTSU. Mm -hmm. And so I started school here, January 1975. Wow, that was quite the journey to get here. How was that year in between when you were just working? What were your experiences then before you came to, before you started classes? School, you mean between? Yeah, between, between when you got here and then when you started classes, that, what was that, 74, 75, I guess, in there? Um, hmm. Well, again, of course, I was working the two jobs. Right. And um, still at home with my mom, and we were living in the projects at that time. A um, place called Council Court. It's named after William Council. Um, and there's a high school in Huntsville named after him, and that's where my mom went. When, and this was actually the segregated high school. So I um, had the two jobs. Um, you know, that was pretty much it. Yeah. Um, I really I can't think of anything else other than, you know, I'm going to save my money mm -hmm. and I'm going to school. Well, the other thing, I guess I did leave something out. Um, I was going to join the Navy. Oh, okay. I was going to join the Navy. I mean, that was the other thing, I was going to join the Navy. And um, because I had gotten some materials from one of the recruiters at the high school, materials from the Navy and then from the the, um, the Marine Corps. My oldest brother, I think I mentioned to you, was in Nam, um, and he was he's a Marine. Okay. And so, um, I, I flirted with both of those. In fact, I applied to both and passed all the tests and everything. I don't know why I didn't. How could have forgotten that? Yeah. But at the very last minute, at the very last minute, my brother got where he got wind of it. Um, and I told him, I said, I always want to either go in the Navy or go in the Marine Corps. And um, he's, I, 
I said, you know, you're my, you're my, you know, you're my mentor. I mean, you're the person who I emulate because growing up, we roomed together with six of us and we roomed together. Uh, and I know I'm worried him to death that we were roomies and, you know, I said, you know, I want to be like you. And he said, no. He says, you're going to make your own footprints. You're not going to be stepping in mine. And that stayed with me. Mm -hmm. It has stayed with me. So, so I, I ended up, you know, not showing up and and taking one foot forward <laughs> and raising my right hand. Yeah. Um, um, did, and, did, his, did you, at that time, learn much about his experiences in Vietnam? Yeah. And that didn't like negatively affect you or well, persuade I, you one way or another to join the military? Well. He didn't talk much about it. Um, the, when he came back, I think it was in 73. Of course, the war was winding down, but he had been there from 70, like 70 or 71. Um, and then he, he went back. He actually did, I think, two tours. Um, but when he came back, um, he, w he couldn't sleep during the day. Um, he used to sleep on the roof. Um, and I mean, he'd have his park on everything he would normally have if he's out in the field. Um, and he has some, I'm sure some pre PTSD issues eventually and some posts, I'm sure eventually PTSD. Mm -hmm. But again, I didn't understand those things. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it seemed like it was kind of abnormal, but at the same time, you know, if he wanted to sleep on the roof instead of being there with, for, you know, with five siblings and my younger sister, maybe that was a way of just kind of winding down. But as as I got older, or as we both got older, you know, he would begin sharing stories about things he saw, things that he did. Um, um, there's one story he tells, and this is when he did a second tour. This was after Vietnam, where he was, he was actually on a, on a battleship. Um, and this was in, a, again, well after May '75, when the war ended, um, but he was on a ba he was on a battleship. He was scheduled to go to Beirut, Lebanon, mm -hmm. um, and U.S. Marines were to be part of a peacekeeping U.N. peacekeeping forces. Um, and at the very last minute, his name, along with 17 others, was taken off. The next week. All the other names, all the all people whose names were on that list, remain on that list, were killed wow. in a um, terrorist attack in Beirut. And so those kinds of traumas, you know, stay with him, and, but he shared them with me too. So, but it also helped me just kind of understand just how fragile life is. Because, right. you know, and just like me, you know, with the experience with my coach, you know, I could have been doing something completely different. I could have been back in the, you know, uh, storage area or something when he came in, but I wasn't. I was standing there cleaning shelves. Life is just, we always say, to me sometimes, life is like zig or zag. Should I, have, should I zig or should I zag? Mm -hmm. And there have been times in my life where maybe I zigged and maybe it wasn't the right thing, but maybe it was the wrong thing. Times when I zagged. And zigzagging, by the way, is a male, is a Navy term that goes okay. back to World War II. Um, when when um, U.S. Um, allied ships, surface ships, mm -hmm. like battleships, would be out in the open waters, especially in the Pacific, because that's where the real battles occurred. Um, they had to be aware of Japanese submarines. So one of the protocols was you, you never moved in a straight line. You zigzagged. The idea of being that if you zigzag, that would minimize the possibility of taking a torpedo hit. Okay. So that's where that yeah. that's where that analogy kind of comes back to, kind of life, you know, yeah. kind of the zigzagging. But he's been he's been very influential in my life. Um, so that that was what happened, I guess, between graduation <laughs> from high school and um, starting at MTSU. The other thing I guess that happened was I had friends that I graduated with 
mm -hmm. you know, in June of 74, who started their freshman year on time. Yeah. And so, and, and, and so that, that kind of worked on me a little. Because it's like, well, you know, I'm going to be behind. You know, if I start, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have this feeling that, you know, I'm going to have to always be trying to catch up. Yeah. And then that's kind of, kind of put in my head, well, you know what? Maybe it's kind of unique, and that's what my mom said. Don't look at it as a bad thing. It's a good thing. You're, you're starting, which is important. It doesn't matter when you started. The fact, the fact is that you did start. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you came to MTSU and you started in '75. January, January '75. January '75. Okay. What did you uh, major in? Um, Pre-law, political science. And why did you decide that? I'm not really sure. <laughs> I mean, other than just. That's a good question. I mean, as opposed to, you know, history, which is something I really love, or maybe even business, or maybe even, even journalism. Mm -hmm. um, but political science just seemed to attract me. Were you interested in politics before that point? Yeah. Were you active in, like, I guess you saw John F. Kennedy from a young age. So yeah, I saw John F. Kennedy when I was, you know, when I was two years old. And then um, in the spring of 1968, I was, would have been in the sixth grade, um, Robert Kennedy announced he's going to run for president very late in the, in the Democratic primary. Of course, he was a U.S. senator from New York. Um, and he made that announcement, believe it or not, in Buffalo. Oh. He made an announcement in Buffalo. Shortly after making that announcement, you know, he creates all these different offices, field offices. Well, he created a field office like right around the corner from where I lived. I grew up on Monroe Street. We call it Presidential Row because one street is William Street, and another street is Jefferson, another one is Clinton, another one is, is Monroe, another one is, Mad is Madison, another one is Adams. So we called it Presidential Row, but it actually was called Dodge, Dodge, Dodge City. Okay. From the TV show Gunsmoke because of all of the shooting. Anyway, I um, had as a kid a couple of different jobs. One of the jobs I had was um, I used to um, deliver groceries for people. I had a wagon and I had a, a newspaper route. So when I wasn't delivering newspapers, I would take my wagon to the grocery store. And when people come up with their bags, I'd ask them, I called it wagon service. <laughs> How much did you charge, do you remember? Probably maybe $2, depending on where they were going. Yeah. So, and my mom said, she told me, she says, she says, you're a business person. She said, for you to think of something like that, and my dad did too. So I would charge like maybe $2 or something, depending on where they're going. Well, anyway... After this one particular time when I made a, a you know, made a, a trip or whatever, I walked by this open air um, storefront that had weeks ago been empty. Mm -hmm. It was called the Zanza Bar, in fact. Lo and behold, all these Robert Kennedy signs up left and right. So I, walk, I go in, keep in mind I got my rat wagon outside, so I go in. I talk to the woman that's the, that's the field director for... Um, for the office, and she said, we're gonna need some people to canvas the area. Are you interested? I'm like, sure. <laughs> so I would use my wagon, and I'd have posters and bumper stickers and, you know, emery boards, whole nine yards, just canvassing the area. Um, and then a couple weeks uh, later, we were all outside in, in the street playing street football. We see this beautiful vehicle coming down the street and then it stops who gets out one guess Bobby Kennedy Wow. he gets out of the car he starts throwing the football with us That's I a kid you not story. wow mm -hmm. did you tell him that you were canvassing for him <laughs> I was mesmerized I had no idea I mean I was just it was just like I was just awestruck and so 
But that did motivate me to work for him. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, a few weeks later, Dr. King was assassinated. Um, and I think, we, I think he was in Indianapolis when that happened. Because Indianapolis was the only place where there weren't riots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, you know, June 4th, you know, he was assassinated, you know, in Los Angeles. So, so that was an experience there, the experience with my dad seeing his brother, John, mm -hmm. you know, I was two, or two years old. Do you um, remember where you were when you found out that Martin Luther King was assassinated? Mm-hmm. I can tell you exactly where I was. I was sitting in the living room on the living room floor, watching the black and white television, watching the the five o'clock news, and there was a news flash. ABC. I remember it just like it was. I remember it just like it just happened today. And I can remember my mom. Um, just going in the bedroom, and we didn't. She didn't have a door on. It was just curtains, and going in there, and crying. Um, I didn't know who he was because believe it or not Malcolm X had been somebody or someone who was very prevalent in the area mm -hmm. but what I did what I did know from um, uh, or know about Dr. King I learned from the radio because he used to have um, a commentary a weekly radio show called Dr. King Speaks. Uh, and it was basically a predominantly uh, radio black radio station in, in Buffalo called um, W um, UFO, um, UFO. And um, he, w he was on W UFO. And then Malcolm X was on WBLK. They're both predominantly black radio stations. And so my mom would actually house clean on Saturdays with the commentaries playing in the background. So that's what I knew about Dr. King. Then I also knew about him because I would see signs posted on the street where he would be coming to Buffalo because he came to Buffalo on several occasions. Mm -hmm. um, but you see those same signs related to, to Malcolm X too. And then I also knew him from seeing um, some of the marches and protests and sit-ins and their arrests that would, they would have on television. Mm -hmm. um, um, I remember seeing some footage about the garbageman strike in Memphis. Uh, but again, I'm a sixth grader. I really can't process what that was about, but I remember it. Mm -hmm. Related, do you remember when you found out when Robert Kennedy was assassinated? Mm -hmm. Tell me about mm -hmm. that. Um, that hit me probably... Uh, it's hard, if not harder, than Dr. King, and that's not a, intended to be, an, you know, um, discredit or, or cast aspersion, and or, or as the kids say today, throw throw shade on him. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the intention here, but I knew I knew more about Bobby Kennedy, because like I said, he was our U.S. senator in New York, and I knew what he was doing, different things. Um, for example, things he was doing in Bed Stuy or in New York, you know, that was like one of the, that was like one of the flashpoints, and you know the, all the property that was happening in New York, and then going to to Appalachia, and him exposing, you know, just the poverty that existed in the United States even at that point. But I was actually um, at home, sleep, because this, you know, it happened. Um, you know, in Los Angeles, and there were two hours, two hour difference there. Right. And um, I'm not, it was like, a, I'm sure it was a weeknight. And um, so my mom comes in and tells me, she actually wakes me up to come in and watch on this television, again, this black and white TV. And I can just remember um, going up, going up our, out of our, tenement unit. Um, they're called row houses. They were, I don't know if you've ever been in New York or Philadelphia or New Jersey. The way houses are, they're row houses, and you got just enough space between them, maybe for somebody to walk through. In fact, we used to 
something called jumping ropes. You jump from one roof to the next oh. roof. Well, I can tell you, I was, that's not what happened, but I remember going outside and going into one of those breezeways and just crying. And then another ironic thing happened. The, this woman whose name was Ethel Anthony, Ethel Anthony, he used to keep me when I was young. Um, my mom said, "Oh, that's that's just that's your she that's 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 just your girlfriend." And then my, Ethel would say, "Yeah, that's my little boyfriend." She's a high school student. I'm probably made two, three, or four years old. Anyway, she had went to the doctor, and then gone to a dentist. And the dentist had told her, you know, she had an abscess on her tooth. And the doctor, not being the professional that he should have been, um, I guess did some sort of procedure that caused the abscess to, to break in and to get in her bloodstream. And she died. Well, Robert Kennedy's wife's name is Ethel. So the very first funeral I ever went to was two days after Robert Kennedy's. I went to Ethel Anthony's funeral. And I'm in a I'm in a in the car with the family and when we go to the church and and um I remember the church being packed and again, this is all happening the same time that Bobby Kennedy's funeral was going on. I don't know if you remember it now, but they took it from actually went from Central Station in New York on a train all the way to, to Washington, D.C. And there were people, Sarah, lined up along the rail, the, the, the train route uh -huh. to see Bobby Kennedy's body just to show their, you know, show their um, respects. And so between Bobby Kennedy's death and then Ethel's death um, and then Dr. King's death um, or assassinations, I would say, um, I mean, I just began to wonder what kind of world it was. It was. Mm -hmm. Later that year, probably November, December, there was um, a atmospheric event. There was actually a um, lunar eclipse. I remember it very vividly. And there was a reporter in Buffalo in fact, he was a news anchor for the ABC affiliate. His name was Irv Weinstein, and he was very eccentric. In fact, I don't know if you've ever seen Anchorman before or whatever. Oh, the yeah. movie? The movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just imagine. I mean, he's kind of like this prototype. In fact, Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey, who grew up in Canada, um, lived in an area where, in the same market as, as uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS in Buffalo. So... A lot of his movies, he he has this Buffalo Canadian blood. Well, anyway, the news anchor, Ed Weinstein, um, did a story late night um, about this lunar eclipse. And what was unique about it, I guess, is most of them are like a powder blue, and this one was red. And he said that was symbolic of bloodshed in the United States in 1968. And, I, and again, I, I'm 10 years old. I remember that very clearly. But it was, it was, a, it was a very traumatic time um, because it was a sense that if this could happen to a Kennedy or a Dr. King, um, it could happen to anyone. In fact, it led to a lot of civil unrest. I remember there being riots in Buffalo and all across the country. Like I, said, the, in the, like I said, the only places that there weren't riots were uh, in Indianapolis and I think one other location. So, um, um, I guess I was going to reference one other thing related to, to my politics. Um, well, what was the story? <laughs> I guess it's worth sharing. The first time I went to Huntsville, you know, I was six years old. We were staying at this the house that my mom grew up in, and um, and that also is kind of think relevant because I just remember all my family having property 
having homes, and having farms. And they had jobs, but then they also had all of this property. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a situation where, you know, it was going to, to stay with somebody who, you know, was destitute, very self-sufficient. And so uh, I remember, again, being with my mom, and we went to this laundromat down the street from my grandparents' home. And there was a, uh, there was a white gentleman in there who was like servicing the wash and the dryer, taking the machine, taking the coins out of the coin tray or whatever, I guess he owns it or whatever stuff. So, so I was just standing there just talking to my mom. So he walks over and he says, does he always talk like that? My mom says, yeah. She says, says where it says where it says where it says where are y'all from? Keep my this is out to Alabama. Mm -hmm. So he's talking to Twang. So my mom says, Well, I'm born here. But he was born in New York. He said, I never heard I never heard a Negro kid talk like that before. So he said, um, talk some more. He just says, talk some more. Well I'm like, what's wrong with this? I'm halfway scared. I'm kind of imagine imagine that you're you're my mom, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm standing here. He's on the other side. I'm doing all I can. I'm sorry. I'm doing all I can. To... Can you hold just a second? It's impossible. Hello. What's your name? Uh, okay. Where was? I'm sorry. You were talking about oh. the the laundry mat. Oh yeah. So again, you're kind of the barrier. Your mom, right? He's on the other side. And I'm doing all I can, stay as close to you, mom, as I can, right? So um, I start talking, but it's not to, and not to, in response to what he's asked. It's in basically in response to me not knowing this man. Mm -hmm. So he gives me a quarter. So I kind of catch on what's going on here. So my mom starts loading the clothes in the washer. And, and the ones that are already washed, you put, just put them in the dryer. So I'm standing here, and we're just talking to this man, just like I'm talking to you. And before it's over, I probably got two or three dollars and quarters. Because he said, I, he said, I never heard a, a Negro kid talk so properly. And of course, since I've been out here, it's all mixed up. But back then, it was very prominent, very, very obvious Yeah. that I grew up in New York. So... Um, that to to me maybe in retrospect, you know, was kind of the sign that maybe there's something here. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it just it was one of those things. Um, there's one other event that happened um, during the second period we're in Buffalo before we moved to back to Huntsville the second time. There's sort of been this. 71. Again, this is when my brother would have been in Vietnam. I was a ninth grader um, at Clinton Junior High. And at that time, the Buffalo Public Schools were not only very segregated, but they were gang infested. I mean, every school had gangs. Um, and I kind of took the position that I wasn't going to join a gang. Um, gang members knew that they were. I had friends that were in gangs. They were. I had friends that were in different gangs. Okay, you know, friends. I mean, we went. We went to different schools together. If that makes sense. And um, so, I recall there being a couple of different public meetings at some of the schools, and I went with my mom. And I was probably, like I said, maybe in eighth grade or so, and. Sarah, I cannot tell you what prompted me to do this in this in this auditorium with all these adults, and I'm the only kid in there. But I stand up and raise my hand, and the superintendent of schools is there along with the school board. And so I speak, again, in the sea of all these adults, and I tell them what I think needs to happen what's wrong and what I think needs to happen. And so 
superintendent just kind of looked at me, kind of just kind of, this just kind of blew me off. Um, but then later on, he kind of came back and, and he didn't say this directly to me, he said it to the audience, something to the effect of, we need to encourage our young people, and da 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 da, and, and the, you know, we may have our differences, but there needs to be more, he didn't use the word inclusiveness, but that was, you know, basically the uh, intention, I think, on his part. So I started doing maybe what you might call mediation in the school with gangs uh, in my junior high, more specifically. Um, and I can remember an incident where I'm leaving school with two of my friends and all three of us are not in gangs. Well, they're what we were, they're what they would call us neutral to some degree. And they had another name for it, but let's just say neutral. And um, we're walking through this breezeway um, at these um, housing projects on our way home. It's a shortcut. And all of a sudden, about four or five gangbangers just come off from nowhere. And so they corner us. And one of the guys grabs me, and they're armed. And a couple seconds later, there's this young man, his name is Carl Brown. And Carl Brown, his gang member, in fact, um, 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 he was one of the high-ranking members of one of the gangs in, in Buffalo. He comes up and he steps in between me and these gang members that are basically his soldiers because he's a he's he's like a captain and he says he says he says uh, you don't y'all don't bother him. He says that's McDonald and he said the other two guys' names and the guys were going to be persistent and want to hurt us. He said I told you to leave him alone, let him go. And so I can't, I can't give you the energy of what was happening there in terms of the environment. Mm -hmm. But it was a situation where, you know, basically live and let live or live and let die. Right. Because that's just what, that's what it's like living in an area where there are gangs. At any given moment, that can happen to anybody. Um, uh, but he knew my brothers. He knew my older brothers. Mm -hmm. So, um, word got back at school what had taken place. And instead of me complaining about what had happened or trying to go to the police, you know, you know, I tried to work with him and others to see how we can have some kind of mediation saying, well, the school is, is neutral territory and there are many kids here that are not gang members like myself and all we want to do is learn. And let's at least have a truce to sit down and talk about things. Um, and eventually that happened, but not because of me, because of some people, more powerful people in our area, council members and state representatives and state senators that got involved in it. Um, and so my senior year, we had what was called, um, you know, Honors Day. Um, senior year being ninth grade. Right. We're going to junior high. Right. And so, um, you know, people get all these different kind of awards and stuff. and. Some of them, they, you know, some of the wars, I guess, people know they're going to get right. Some of them, it's kind of like a surprise. Mm -hmm. well, well, I, well, I fell into the second category because the superintendent um, had um, awarded me the Dr. King Gold Medal of Peace. Wow. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom was there, and, you know, media was there, and I still, I've got the medal. I got it in the curio cabinet That's um, great. Um, I mean, and so my, I think that probably that that event or those series events maybe you know sort of give some indication of maybe where I was headed yeah I mean I don't know 
But um, I mean that's that's one of the things I guess I really cherish. I know what happened here and some other things that happened beyond MTSU. Others think are really, like really really important, but there's some things that that are just not on even on the radar that I just think are just so critical, and I think that's one of them. Because I didn't do it for an award, I didn't even know about the award. Right. I knew I didn't know anything about the medal. I didn't know anything about you know the the monetary gift. I think it was like a twenty five or fifty dollars or something like that before ninth grade. That's a lot of money. Yeah. So, and my mom was there, and she was she was very very proud. My dad, he he never really he never really I think. Um, He, he just took a different attitude about, you know, achievements and awards and a lot of the things that I did. He he just he he just he never would even weigh in on them or say you did a good job or I'm proud of you whatever. Um, that didn't happen until I was on my deathbed. Mm -hmm. But my mom was always, I mean, she was like she was just always, you know. Um, that navigator, uh, she's always the kind of the person who was like, okay, yeah, okay, I know things don't look well right now. Um, they're not as, not like we would prefer they be, but this is due to the day at a time. So, um, but she, I mean, she was, she was extremely proud of me. My dad's attitude, and I, uh, the last thing I would do is, is same thing disparaging about them because I love them both. You know, they're both going on to God. But um, um, I think in some respects he maybe felt like he didn't do enough. And I understand why the, he, he was the way he was because of what he had seen happen to him as a kid in terms of his own mom, my paternal grandmother being beat. Um, and so, you know, I'm an adult now and looking back, I can kind of understand that. That doesn't mean I agree with what he did, but he just, he, he was, he just, he didn't, he, he, he kept his emotions close. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas when my mom was more affectionate, she was more like, yeah, you know, you guys are doing great, da da da, keep it up or whatever. But she also could be, you know, she could she could also be that drill sergeant. You know, time to come in. You guys do your homework. Da, 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 da. But that was, I think, maybe that was another. You know, a watershed moment in my life. Yeah. Where, perhaps, and my mom said this. These are not my own words, but where, you know, she always said, "I love all my children." Children but I may not necessarily love them all the same because they're different. And she used to tell my dad, Michael, he's just different. He's extremely different from the others. And um, we got to get him room to be where he wants to be. I mean, I was, I was always the last kid picked for anything. I was short, stubby. Um, I was a lefty. Oh, no. <laughs> So every everything that I did was just it was it it was not status quo, right? And so I just kind of had to find my own way. Um, I mean, and it was as lonely as it was. It was my journey. You know, it was my journey. I mean, I would I remember as a kid um, just having this affection for paper and writing. Anything that looked like an office, I wanted to have it. Mm -hmm. For Christmas, my brothers, they got bikes and stuff. You know what I wanted for Christmas? I wanted a typewriter, I wanted a globe, I wanted these things. And we had an attic, and I would go up in the attic, and I had like this mini office. And when everybody else was playing, I'm upstairs and I'm writing and doing reading and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And maybe it sounds weird, but that was, that was my childhood. Yeah. 
All right, let's get back to sorry MTSU. No, I enjoy. Sorry. I think all those stories kind of build up to your time at MTSU. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to deviate. No, it's totally okay. fine. Deviate as much as you want. Okay. <laughs> We're here for you to tell your story. Okay. So if you think of something you want to say, just say it. Okay. Um, so you studied political science. Right, political science, and um, then um, of course I was working at State Farm. Right. Right. So you work at the same time. State too. Farm. Um, and so I worked the third shift. Okay. So I'd have classes in the morning and then try to get some sleep um, in the afternoon. But around 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, when everybody else is going to sleep, I'm getting ready to go to work. I didn't have a car, so I bought a bike from someone. And so I used to ride my bike from MTSU down Main Street all the way to, to Broad to, to, the, to work. And then I ride it back. And sometimes one of my coworkers, you know, would just put my bike in the back of their pickup truck, and so I didn't have to do all that. But usually I, I was making that ride. And then, and then I have I had four classes my first semester. Um, I had English with Professor Peck, who's named. It. So now on, I'm now on a building. On yeah. a building. <laughs> um, I had a journalism 101 course. I had an American government course. And then I had a, a science course, physical science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was your, uh, do you remember your first impressions of Murfreesboro and MTSU? Um, do you remember how you felt that first semester? on campus? The first semester, it was just more about just trying to find my way, where yeah. things were, just getting around. Um, so my freshman year, um, again, I was just taking part-time courses. I was living on campus, though, in Sims Hall. Um, so I knew and experienced campus life to some degree. But that really didn't happen until my sophomore year. Um, but my first impression of Murfreesboro was kind of this sleepy town. Mm -hmm. Having grown up in Buffalo, it was just kind of like, man, this is really, really different. Um, but different kind of in a, in, a, in a good way. I mean, I didn't have a lot of negatives about it at the time. I mean, that that's not true today. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have a, I didn't have any negatives at least that concern me enough that I would articulate them or share them with anyone. Um, that probably didn't happen until my sophomore year because I began to see the difference between being on campus and being off campus. In fact, we eventually began to use the term being on the res, like the reservation. Oh, okay, yeah which is kind of a throwback to World War II and, and black soldiers, you know, things that they could do on the base, you know, versus things they couldn't do off the base. Um, so, um, and that just became very prevalent. I mean, you just know certain places that, you know, you have to be careful going. Mm -hmm. um, and and there, were, there were not a lot of uh, support systems for African American students off campus, and there weren't very many on campus. Mm -hmm. um, again, my, my having grown up in New York, and the, the school, the schools I went to, like for for example, from kindergarten, all kindergarten to second grade. I mean, it was a melting pot. The neighborhood that I grew, initially grew up in in New York, it was a melting pot. I have kids, friends that were Irish, Puerto Rican, Polish, Italian, Jewish. I mean, it was just this melting pot. And we used to, we would fight each other as kids, but nobody else could fight us mm -hmm. without somebody intervening or that kind of thing. Um, the one of the women who babysat me when I was a child um, was Jewish. 
She lived across the hall from us in, in the projects. I come to Murfreesboro, and this is the true apostle, come to Murfreesboro, and I just see this, I just had never seen such segregation before. Um, I'd never seen um, such an oppressive state. And, and, and to have it on campus, and have it on campus in ways where you just quote, no, you don't do this. No, you don't go there. Did you have, when, so when you first arrived you, and you're meeting other black students, did they kind of tell you how it was? Like, here's where you can go, here's where you can't go, here are some good professors, here are some racist ones maybe, or ones that are not going to be kind to you? Did that kind of, did that happen? No, it was just more about trial and error. I had one or two upperclassmen who helped me get jobs on campus. They were like the first African-American students to work in campus police or resident life. Um, but as far as, as, far as uh, um, them sitting down and you know, doing, having the sage old conversation about okay, these things, it was more through trial and error. Um, for example, the Keithley University Center, just walking in the cafeteria and just seeing how segregated it is. And Dr. King talked about, you know, 11 o'clock on Sunday being the most segregated hour in the United States. We now know they may have a, they may have a, um, a, um, a contender because lunch and dinner in most communities and cities are probably much more segregated than any church. And that's how Keithley Cafeteria would look. Or Cummings Hall or, or the sub. Um, very segregated. When you go to a sporting event like at Murphy Center um, or Jones Field, very segregated. Um, number one and number two, there's also this very um, prominent, visible presence of white supremacy in the footprint that makes itself very prevalent. The fact that I don't, the fact that Maybe I um, don't articulate it um, maybe a lot um, then or now. Doesn't mean I'm not aware of it. Um, and it was very prevalent back then. Um, in, high, in high school in Huntsville, we kind of got this baptism of racism with some of the teachers, instructors. Um, and I had some of that here. I mean, I won't, I won't mention any names, but I had a couple professors who, you know, from where I sit, you know, made it very clear, you know, yeah, you can register for this course, but don't plan, don't plan to advance. Um, you know, and they also had this, this sense of, um, well, the only reason why the African-American students are here is because they're athletes. It was never, there was never this thought that was entertained that an athlete could be a thinking student athlete, could be cerebral and, and, and understand uh, events beyond the court or the field or the track. Um, and, um, you know, I, was, I played ball for a while and I quit. Um, and one of the reasons why was I felt this need to give greater attention to the things we're probably going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. um, the sense that having a, a basketball, football player take certain classes, um, they're not going to pass these classes because they don't have the aptitude to be here, and they wouldn't be here if they weren't an athlete. Um, and you had, and, and, and even back then, there were some professors, even elected officials, in the, the city and county, who, you know, they celebrated, you know, athletes when they were winning. But 
beyond that, we have any need for them. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I saw. Do you remember seeing the Confederate symbols on campus? You mentioned Keithley. Do you remember the giant plaque that was on Keithley? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you know what that was right away? Who that was right away? No, but I learned very quickly because it was prominent in almost everything. You, you, for example, the MTSU bookstore, the Blue Raider bookstore. You buy a no, you buy a notebook, um, or a ream of a notebook paper. That seal, that emblem was on it. That had figurines and all sorts of, of, of jewelry. Symbolic of Nathan Bedford Forrest. I mean, you couldn't, you could not walk into, for example, um, Murphy Center. They'd have a plaque of him, like the 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 um, the the runway breeze, breezeway for the basketball players coming up the ramp, happening on both sides. You know, they would be on billboards around campus and in the city. Um, and then, of course, at basketball game I mean, football games, you'd have the mascot and, you know, and a horse. Mm-hmm. Did people bring the Confederate flag to games, too, and wave it around? I saw a few, but not like I did in Huntsville. Oh, yeah. No, no, what you, no, what you saw, what you saw at games here would be People singing Dixie. Okay. And again at Butler, we had a double dose with the sign, with the flags, and the song. But it wasn't uncommon for um, the song to be sang and to be played by the Blue Raider band mm-hmm. with African American students in the stands and on the field. Yeah. At some point, I'm sure we're going to talk about me being, running for SGA president, and I can mm-hmm. tell you a story about related to the Kappa Alpha Order and, and Confederate flags. Tell it now. Oh, really? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, when I was running for president, which is actually 40 years ago this month, um, I went to every fraternity house. And uh, one of the houses I visited, visited was the K Order, and um, of course I should walk in and got this nicely manicured grass and got this huge cannon sitting in the front yard. Um, and on the railings, the porch railings, they've got just rolls of Confederate flags. And of course, there's a keg or two on the porch. <laughs> what fraternity house would be complete without a keg? This is gonna surprise you, what I'm gonna tell you. So, I. Uh, walk up to the door and knock on the door and one of the members of the K fraternity opens the door and he shakes my hand and he says, welcome to the K house. So we go in this room. Keep in mind, I'm sure the other two people I ran against were invited to. I'm sure they showed at some point. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've already been there on an opening. So I walk in this open air room. There's probably maybe 75, 80 people in here, fraternity brothers. And of course, I'm the only speck in there. And so the president of the chapter comes over and he shakes my hand, he welcomes me to the the house. And um, so I just give my laundry, (laughs) my laundry speech, right? I start talking. And so um, a couple of brothers start asking me questions. Those related to race. It's all related to homecoming. Who's going to be, who's going to be in charge of homecoming? Or are you going to change that? And can we do this? And can we do that? And so I'm beginning to think this is not just about organizing homecoming. It's going to be about some of the emblems and symbols and the things, right? Mm-hmm. So I just kind of give the company response, which is, if I'm elected president, it's my plan to have um, a brother K A be one of the coordinators so that we can continue to have a tradition of how things are going to be. And so I think that kind of 
appease their concerns in terms of well, are you just going is this going to turn into a quote a black or Negro event, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was elected. And a couple months later, when we started planning for homecoming, these issues came up. We're going to what's going to be permitted on the floats, flags and you know Confederate, whatever. And so I took the position that that was not going to be the case. We were going to we were come up with a theme that has nothing to do with the Union or the Confederacy or anyone. So the theme became Star Wars. Because it was their, it was their ambition or their intent to make this like, you know, something that old miss. Right. And, and so I had to try to come up with what I consider to be maybe a compromise to some degree. Some, you know, something race neutral or, and, and so that was what we did. But Why did you originally get involved in student government? How did that come about? Because um, you, you were in student government before you became president, right? Yes, but I was in the BSA before I became involved in student government. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to get involved. I, mean, I wanted to get involved in some activity. I was a, I was a resident assistant um, over at Sims Hall, and then I was serving on the traffic court. And so that's how I got, in, got involved with SGA. Mm -hmm. But I really was involved with the BSA. And that's the Black Student Association. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And my involvement there was being, uh, believe it or not, I was the election coordinator for the BSA. Elections. I mean, but I got, I guess, um, um, disenchanted when I was, things were happening, some of the internal strife which exists in any organization. With BSA? Yeah, BSA. Mm -hmm. um, not so much the issues that they were addressing, but more about how they were going about it, number one, and number two, the infighting. It was more, it was kind of this power struggle. And to some degree, um, I, I took the position that maybe some thought me as a threat. And there were a couple of people that were like, had been president or held different offices for some time. I'm like, well, at some point, somebody's going to have to take the reins because you're going to graduate, right? But I was just trying to serve some purpose. And so I said, you know, I like the part about coordinating the elections. It's something, again, it's neutral. Okay, whoever's going to run for office, they can run, I, you know, that's fine. I just want to be involved with the logistics. That's what encouraged me. That's what, I guess, enticed me, the logistics of it, um, and trying to make a difference, trying to have an impact, um, even if it was incremental, being able to see change occurring. You know, I did that for, I think, my freshman year, and like I said, it's kind of got burned out with it. Um, and so I just began to kind of reassess how I was spending my time beyond being a resident assistant and some of these other things. And um, I have no idea how this seed was ever planted. But I said, you know what? Maybe one day I can be student body president. Why can't I? It never, it, Sarah, it never occurred to me it never entertained my, it, it never even surfaced or became a question about race. If, a, if an African American or Negro or color person could, could run and win. I never even knew if anybody black had ever run. I have no idea about that. It was, it was just never, it was just never a set of uh, a thoughts that are entertained, that uh, entered my mind or that I entertained. So the person who got me involved in SGA, his name is Ted Helberg, 
Ted Hilbert was SGA president my freshman year, and um, he was an SAE. And I don't know their reputation now, but back then they were very powerful on campus. Almost every SGA president uh, at some point in time over that 10-year cycle had been an SAE. Mm -hmm. um, and he just kind of took a liking to me. Uh, Ted Hilbert from Dixon, Tennessee. And I told him, after he had been elected SGA president, I said, I'm going to have your job one day. <laughs> and, he, and he looked at me and he said, I don't see why not. Now, that was how I got involved with him in traffic mm -hmm. court. And then... Um, he moved me from traffic court to the student supreme court, okay. Okay, which I did for, for a year. And then Richard Langford, who uh, was uh, Ted's successor, he kept me on the supreme court for a second year. So it was tra student tra traffic court to, um, actually I guess it was a year. It was, it was um, um, a semester for the traffic court. And then three semesters for the student supreme court. That makes sense. So that would be the two years. Mm -hmm. Then my junior year, um, I was going to run for president. Well, Sarah, there were seven people running for president, and nobody running for vice president, speaker of the senate. So the, the young lady I was dating at the time, who's no longer with us, she said, "There's seven people running, and you'd be eight but there's nobody running for this. Run, just run for this. So I ran for vice president. I ran unopposed. And then we know what happened the whole year. So, um, so you're running for president. Mm -hmm. Your senior year then, mm -hmm. right? Did you ever at any point become aware that you might become the first black student body president? Did anyone t when you did win? Did anyone tell you that you were the first? Were I had I had I had a couple of administrators who said it could never happen. Um, we have a mutual friend, a professor who knows this story. I won't mention a name, but a teacher who I had for Western Civ Civilization. Um, he used to call me Black Mac. You can laugh if you want. He used to call me Black Mac. I take it now as a term of endearment, because I've, because we we kind of halfway became friends. Yeah. After that, well, he Sarah he bet me, he bet that I would not win. He said, "There's no way in the world you will win." He said, "Nothing." He said, "Nothing against you." He said, "This campus is not ready." He says, "This community is not ready." And he pulls out a, he pulled out a half a dollar, a Kennedy quarter, of all things, to, yeah, I was about to, to say. with me. <laughs> <laughs> he pulled out a Kennedy quarter, and he said a half dollar. And he said, he says, um, I'm going to bet you, I'm going to bet you're going to win. I'm that sure. Um, and this was like. The week before the elections were like, they were held on two days, like a f Tuesday and a Wednesday. And um, so, you know, I had two opponents. One was the president of the Interfraternity Council, mm -hmm. IFC, and the other was um, president of the SAEs, the largest fraternity on campus. Um, and so everybody's, it was just this, this assumption or just prediction that there was no way we were, us people say I win. I always would say we we would not win because there were things that we started to do. I started to do my I think um, when I got on the student supreme court. I mean, in terms of planning and you know putting together an organization, who's going to do what, and just mapping out the campus because in, in the way that we in the way we won because we did win. Uh, it wasn't because we started this overnight. It was something that we had been working on for at least two years. Um, and things just lined up. I mean, I was sharing with a, 
um, uh, <clears throat> one of the faculty members again that we we know very well. Um, she was asking me, "How did it happen?" I said, "What? Well, it's almost like the stars just lined up. It's just like this apparition that I don't think it ever happened. I didn't think it would ever happen again, but it has. But at least in that period of time, in 1978. So, and it wasn't just that." We won, but was the margin that we won by eight to one, eight to one margin against two opponents, um, and it was the work that we did. And so I just remember that following week coming into class, and um, it's like uh, he's going to eat crow, and he did. It was it was it was like it was like he he couldn't even lecture. He couldn't even lecture because the students in the class were like, well. Are you? I mean, are you just gonna? Are you gonna fess up? And these were black and white students, right? I mean, and I don't know who they voted for, but I, we all were interested to see how he's gonna respond to this. So before the class was over, he stand. You know, he asked me to stand up. He says, he says, well, Black Mac, I guess we did it, didn't we? And some of the students were like, well, it wasn't we, it was us, right? And so I just told him, I said, well, there's only one thing I will, I want right now. And he said, "What?" I said, "I want the Kennedy Quarter." Did he give it to you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I had I kept it for years. I kept, I have no idea where it is, but but he did. Um, and there were some administrators that were they were they were not happy, mm -hmm. but then there were others that were very very happy about it. You know, I can I can think of some folks that like and that were like with the newspaper sidelines and the Midlander. Or, working in the mass media area that were excited about it. Um, Did you get any sense of how black students on campus felt about it? It was mixed reviews. I mean, there were, and and this is something I've just lived with. Um, it was always, you're too black or not black enough. That I have learned that's always kind of, the, that's the, the um, high wire act that I think a lot of African American leaders and Hispanic leaders or Mexican American leaders, you know, have to have to negotiate. And I, I that became a training ground for me, believe it or not. It became like a learning tree for me. Um, but there were some blacks who they were very, very excited about it. But then there was a select few, maybe even more than that, who were just resentful and, you know, who are you or you know, or, you know. Did black student associations support you during your, your campaign? Do you um, remember? Sorry for my stomach. Um, um, yeah, and back then it wasn't, back then it had, it had more from the BSA to something called the Executive Council. It's called Executive, which I think is very, it's, very relevant for what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. The Executive Council became like a think tank, had representatives of all the black fraternities and sororities in the BSA. And then something called the Cool Club, KC, the Cool Club, which was a very powerful group. Mm -hmm. Okay, So um, the Executive Council, which was created by Tommy Brown. Tommy Brown was the first African-American director of minority affairs. Mm -hmm. He is a trailblazer. He and Al Wil Wilkerson, um, who's no longer with us, both of them are deceased. I mean, they laid the framework for for the executive council, and 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 they were both black activists. Tommy Brown was on the track team he, um, with Willie Brown. Okay, so the executive council um, um, was like a political arm, just like me going to. The K order, I I went to the executive council, made a presentation, um, and asked for their vote. I didn't assume that I was going to get it just because I was black. I mean, I went there and I solicited their vote, and then I also went to each fratern black fraternity and sorority, and, and when they held their meetings, and asked for their votes, and they were very supportive. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons is because I hadn't become a Greek yet. And that may not be relevant to others, but had I been a, uh, an alpha at that point and not just been a, a black candidate, 
there might have been some resistance for them supporting me. But I had not become Greek yet. I was independent. I became a Greek after. And that was another strategic decision. Why did you become a Greek? Which which frat? I'm an you alpha. Join? I'm an alpha. Okay. Yeah. Of course Dr. King was an alpha and I that's my grade school teacher was an alpha. I have three brothers uh that are sigmas. Okay. I have, I have other <laughs> members that are so that's so but Again, that was another strategic decision. You know, I said, well, I want to pledge. But if I pledge, how is this going to impact me winning? And I, and I realized, no matter what I thought, that idea was out there, that there might be some resentment. So, But they were very supportive. I mean, um, in terms of canvassing campus and getting out the vote, um, just like I had, I had coordinators Handling all the resident life. Um, you you name you need a contingency. We had a team that was there to mobilize the vote. So, um, but I always saw always saw our election as a win win um, for black students, for students like myself. Mm -hmm. um, I mean. Somebody asked me why I was running. I said I'm running to win. I mean, it's kind of it was kind of a kind of a dumb question. It was almost like, well, you can't be running to win. What's your message? What are you trying to get out there? Because you can't be running to win because you're not going to win. I'm running to win, and once we win, then there's some changes we're going to make because these changes can only be made internally. They can't be made from the outside. They can't be made, um, at least in this environment in 1978, 79, um, in the way that I, I think would be, you know, that I know that people prefer to do, marching, protesting, whatever. There's some ways that maybe we can walk, knock these walls down from the, outs from the inside, where we haven't been able to do it from the outside. And also was his mindset that, almost like Dr. King and Malcolm X, um, they're going to listen. They're going to they're going to have to make a decision about who they're going to listen to. Either they're going to listen to Malcolm, they're going to listen to Martin. And they both understood that while they may have have different ideologies, they benefited each other. Right. And so that's kind of how I saw it. Okay, maybe, maybe the administration won't listen to me, but maybe they'll listen to the BSA, which is still there. Maybe they'll listen to the BSA, but maybe now they'll listen to me. What were some of those changes you wanted to make? First one was taking that decal, that emblem off the Keefley. That was one of the first, that was one of the first, I think, um, challenges that we had and I haven't said much about this in fact this is probably the first time that I have publicly even referenced this in terms of some things that we did but I, I had meetings with President Scarlett about this um, and uh, Dr. Ingram and we had put we had put plans in place about how to get that you know that um, seal removed mm -hmm. in the time frame for doing it um, you know, literally kind of like my mom packing us up in the middle of the night, you know, to minimize, you know, the pushback from it. Um, there are other things that we had means about in terms of making changes related to race relations, things that, that are better now. I'm not saying that's the reason why, but I know that the seeds were planted because of things that we did, not I did, that we did, the dialogue that we had, the means that we had, um, the um, um, the willingness to um, look at the culture and to look at how we can begin to make some changes because, because of the optics um, that I saw, even as president, because it didn't stop, you know, I mean, the way people treated me to some degree maybe got better, but there still were areas where it's like, well, 
No, you, you're black. You just happen to be the president, right? So um, I, I believe that there were some inroads that were made. Um, you know, just like Sylvester and others who came before me, you know, began to knock down the blocks. There's some things that we did to knock down the blocks. I mean, it's 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 a generational sort of battle. Um, what I what I do kind of take pride in, and again, not for myself, but for for the people that I work with, was that uh, it was inclusive, which made it very made it very difficult for the media or administrators to say this is some kind of black cool. We had we had students that were not African American that understood and was not just sympathetic, they were empathetic and they were upset with going to ball games and, and seeing flags and hearing hearing the band. That probably bothered me as much as that seal. Mm -hmm. Using state dollars to, to you know, to play this these songs. And eventually the repertoire was changed. And they literally went from playing Dixie to Michael Jackson, I kid you not, <laughs> which was really kind of strange. Um, you mentioned Sylvester Brooks. Were you aware of what happened in the late 60s with him and his fellow black students when you were at school, when you were president? Did you know about his story or did you learn about that later in life? Um, I knew bits and pieces of it because the um, um, I want to call it a fireside chat because what occurred on the president's steps, right? The cross burning, mm -hmm. and yeah, then the march to exactly President Scarlet President's House, house yeah. yeah, Scarlet's House. I knew about that. In fact, Doctor Scarlet. Um, to some degree, debrief me on it, because um, he wanted me to understand the history. But then there were some African American students who who were there that I uh, I knew and and uh, met, for example, like at homecomings when I was still here, that would tell me this story. And then the sidelines, for whatever reasons, when there literally was a paper, I remember them doing a couple of. Um, of um, op-eds about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know, I did know in fact history, but I didn't know the intensity of it um, really until after I graduated. Right. Mm -hmm. when, I come back, when I would come back for homecomings and you had this mix of students from, from different eras. Um, I've never met Sylvester, he's never met me, okay? Um, not personally, but but I do know that story. And Dr. Rucker, Robert Rucker, was one of my instructors for sociology. Right. So, so he shared the story with me. I heard it firsthand from him. Mm -hmm. He was very instrumental and influential in me being able to, to hold my seat mm -hmm. and, hold, hold, and hold the administration's feet to the fire on things. Was he kind of a mentor for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he had just come back from, I think he had just finished his his graduate work at St. Louis U, and he came back, and he was one of the first African American instructors we had. Mm -hmm. um, but he, very humble, reserved, but I mean, I, I have nothing but respect for him, and he would share these stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to hear it, it's another thing for someone who was there to tell you about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I mentioned, at least in one of the emails to you, you know, you know, just the environment that existed when Dr. King was assassinated um, in the country. And then my brother telling me stories about what was going on overseas. You know, he wasn't there in 68, but he said it existed in 70, 71, segregated camps, you know, Confederate flags left and right. So, so you had a lot of that. We had um, veterans coming back to school. 
Right. Mm -hmm. So it was it was very prominent. Um, in terms of the BSA and you know its history in terms of you know the different battles that maybe occurred when it's, you know the '60s and the early '70s before I got here. A lot of that, or what knows what I know about it, is fragmented, but I'm aware of it. Um, and a lot of those stories are not flattering for the university or for MTSU. I mean, stories about students going off campus and being harassed and having to pay for their meals before they eat. I know a lot of those stories because we lived a lot of those stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you experience? So you mentioned this kind of things you could do on campus and things right. you couldn't do off campus. Do you remember some places in Murfreesboro maybe that were more hostile? Mm -hmm. Sure do. There were some places that were, you know, they're very welcoming. Um, but I can remember some places that were very reserved. Mm -hmm. um, and in some respects, um, Murfreesboro was like a, what we call a sundown town. You know, it maybe would not, it wouldn't, would, would not want to admit to that reputation. But there were many pockets of Murfreesboro in Middle Tennessee, just like northern Alabama and southern Kentucky, I guess. We as blacks, we call them sundown towns. Um, and you just know at a certain time, you better be on campus. And if you go off campus, you better not go by yourself. It better be a group. For example, we may have, we would have like a party or something on campus, um, usually like in Keithley, the place I was at, was <laughs> supposed to be supposed to go here. Uh -huh. And we'd have dances on campus. And um, or may have something in dance studio, A, B, or C, Murphy Center. Party ends at 12 o'clock. We have what we call an after set. Go to somebody's apartment or house or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now everybody's hungry. Well, this is Murfreesboro, 1977, 78, or 79. There's not a lot of places. There's no Chick-fil-A and McDonald's 24-7. But there is a Crystal's, you know. So everybody hop in the car and go to Crystal as a group. You don't go by yourself. At least three people. I mean, you, we basically had a posse. Because so if something goes down, something happens, you're not by yourself. And if you go off campus, even if it's a trio, you let somebody else know where you're going and when you plan to be back. And of course, there weren't any cell phones back then. Right. So, you know, if something went wrong, you know, they'd have to call somebody on their dorm room or their house apartment phone or something. But um, and then we we would make a lot of journeys to Nashville. Nashville was kind of okay, you know, but Murfreesboro, in terms of it, a being a place for, for students, to, black students to socialize, there was probably I know two places that were safe. Uh, one of them was called one was the National Guard Armory, the other was the Elks Club. The Oaks Club? The Elks. Like Elks Elk Club. Elks, Elk. Okay. Yeah, Elks yeah. Club, sorry, Elks Club. Uh -huh. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, in law enforcement, I mean, wouldn't hesitate to harass. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. My junior year, and, and I think I mentioned, I'm just saying Murfreesboro, Middle Tennessee. My junior year, um, I went to a SGA conference at University of Tennessee Chattanooga, and um, I drove in my car to the um, conference, and along with me was a young lady by the name of Joy Heath. Joy was my, she was my compadre because back then we had two VPs, Vice President and Speaker of the House, Vice President and Speaker of the Senate, and Joy was Speaker of the, the House. so. Joy was also uh, Caucasian, strawberry blonde. I mean, just striking mm -hmm. red hair. 
So Joy, she 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 says, well, is this going to be okay with you um, um, for me to ride with you? Us riding together. I'm like, sure. Again, Sarah, I'm not thinking about Middle Tennessee and the Klan and all this other stuff. So we're on our way to Chattanooga. Our car breaks down on Mount Eagle. Call the state troopers. They're, no, I want to call them. They see us broken down. Car's broken down. I didn't call them. And so call a record. They tow my car to this repair shop. Um, I mean, and it looked like something out of Deliverance, the movie Deliverance. Have you ever seen that? Um, the building and the people. This guy comes out and, and you know, he asks me, you know, what's wrong because he sees a wrecker in the car. So I tell him, broke down, and so they move it into the the um, bay and the garage, and, and so I'm in the car and Joy's in the car. So I get out and I said, tell Joy, I said Joy, do not get out of the car. Because my assumption, I'm thinking, well. Okay, you just kind of stay in and maybe they won't see you. So, um, get the car repair, get it repaired. I get, you know, I pay the man and so I'm, I get in the car and I'm backing out of the bay of the garage. And so, this other man who's sitting on like a park bench, kind of whittling, he looks over at me and he says, he says, boy, what are you doing with that white woman? Sarah, I just, I can't, I can't, I cannot tell you how I figured this out or what maybe said. I said, oh, her, I work for her father. He said, oh, okay, do you all need anything? Yep. Yeah. True story. Because... And I, and I hope you can understand the import of that. Right. Um, but the idea of us being a married couple or dating, you know, in that environment, it'd be something that would just, I mean, would be an abomination. So, which was, I mean, are you, I mean, you're talking about the VSA and race relations. I mean, that's another area that was was something that, you know, and me growing up in New York, the high school I went to, you know, like something out of West Side Story, mm -hmm. you know, like dating whites, white dating Puerto Rican. I mean, now there may be some families that were, you know, like, well, like I said, it's like the West Side Story, families may resent it or whatever, but the two young people, they're like, hey, this is not our problem, it's their problem. Um, and there was... I mean, there was begin to see a lot of interracial dating on campus. Uh, I'm sure um, there's more today than there was back then. But um, that, I think, also helped kind of break down some of the barriers. And then we had African, you had, you had um, begin to have the school push for, or us pushing the school for African American acts. That was another thing I did. Like for homecoming, I said, we're going to have some African-American acts. Right. We had the Commodores and LTD. We're going to get some blacks on student programming, get blacks on different committees. That's what I meant by breaking, breaking it down internally. Right. Because um, this wasn't about me. And so, anyway, but we're talking about Mount Eagle or whatever. That was kind of experience that a lot of interracial couples had. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. What are some other things that you did as president that you are proud of? Can we take a break? Yeah. Can we? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of our achievements, um, one of the things I did uh, as J president was I took a trip to the University of Colorado Boulder for a student government convention. Mm -hmm. 
while I was at Colorado Boulder, uh, of course, was on campus and had an opportunity to kind of take in their, their dining facilities. In their student cafeteria, they had McDonald's, they had Hardee's, they had Baskin Robbins, they had Pizza Hut, they had Burger King. So I'm taking notes. This is kind of like a fact-finding trip for me, right? Taking in the campus of just some of the amenities and benefits and just the, the campus life. So one of the things I did when I got back was I met with the Dean of Students mm -hmm. and Dr. Scarlett, and I gave them basically a debriefing of things I'd seen and put together a short list of initiatives that I wanted to put in place for campus life. One of the items at the top of the list was fast food. And like a year or two later, it was implemented. So maybe the dietitians or people in the health profession may not, you know, I guess give me any accolades for that. But to me, that was, that was a plus because we actually told the students that we we're moving in that direction because the food was so bad. The second thing that we did was a lot of our students commuted, commuters. Mm -hmm. This was what we call a suitcase college back then. Uh, Monday through Thursday, um, campus alive. Friday afternoon, every parking lot on campus is empty. I mean, it, I mean basically, um, it, it looked like you know, a, a tornado hit it because nobody here. So, um, in addition to trying to create weekend activities to encourage students to stay here, we also started looking at plans for um, trying to uh, improve life for community students that commute. We used to have a commuting board in the basement of Keefley, mm -hmm. so people could kind of connect, you know, put like a three by five card on there and stuff. I know we got phones and stuff, you can do the iPhones, you can do that now, but back then that was the mode. You know, put a three by five card on the board and say, you know, I'm looking for a ride to McMinnville or, or to Manchester or Nashville or Fayetteville or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did was, the second thing I think is most important was start to talk about how to put some type of um, transportation initiative in place so that would replace this you know travel board because mm -hmm. um, a lot of the students commuted from Nashville and so the first thing we had talked about was uh, perhaps Greyhound would be interested in in having some kind of initiative, at least at least part of their line that goes from from Nashville to Chattanooga. Maybe they could have some kind of commuting sort of initiative for our students. Right. Come on campus, wrap around, and get them back to Nashville. That sort of thing. Um, that wasn't really feasible because Greyhound is a national corporation, and they have multiple lines to kind of cut themselves with. Mm -hmm. So we be, kind of scaled that back and said, well, what about Metro? Nashville? You know, the MTA, and I don't know what, what it was called back then, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's MTA now. Um, maybe they'd be interested in trying to put together some kind of commuter service. So, Sarah, that those discussions that we had planted the seeds for what we now do. Right. Yeah, there is a bus that comes down. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And and I, I know, like I said, this has been a we thing, but that was really an I thing for me because it put a lot of work into it. Mm -hmm. um, so I took me and said, well, hey, Greyhound, they're, they're not going to make a penny off of this. In fact, they would lose money doing this, trying to break, you know, um, have uh, MTSU is one of the stops. You know, between Nashville and it really is Nashville and Chat in Atlanta is what it was. Yeah. What made more sense was more feasible was on Nashville and MTSU uh, because you have a natural relationship there. Right. So, 
And the next thing we did um, was um, improve uh, campus police. Um, one of the concerns that I had was campus safety. Um, and so we talked to campus police about providing um, escorts, student escorts, service. And um, surprisingly, that took little of any effort. It was just a matter of asking, sitting down and talking with Chief Royal. His name was Matthew Royal. He was chief of the campus police department at the time. He and then um, the president and the dean of students and some others. Um, and literally a, an escort service. Um, because we had had, I think, probably um, two or three sexual assaults on campus during that period of time. Um, and it wasn't, it, it didn't get the kind of attention that it would now because of media, you know, right. whatever. But, but, you know, news travels fast, bad news fast, travels faster. And so there was a sense that, well, if you're in the library, you know, late at night, you don't need to be walking back to your dorm by yourself. That's there. Um, we had... Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other things we did. Well, just on that briefly, was that, did you come up with that? Was that an effort? Was there a, what am I trying to say? An event? Was there like a voice from women, from from female students saying like, we don't feel safe? No, it was just that I, I, I was aware of a couple of reports mm -hmm. incidents that had happened. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Sarah, now that you mention it, I do recall one student coming to, to our office mm -hmm. and speaking to someone in our office about it. Because um, we had put together, put out a survey. Right. Um, that's another thing we did, survey, um, um, asking students what, you know, their their needs are, what they, cons what they consider to be important, what they, what they want SGA to focus on. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that was probably one of the comments or, 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 or issues that was, you know, addressed in those surveys. Mm -hmm. And that survey too, I mean, now that we think about it, was a critical tool because my hope is that it maybe gave my successors some things to look at. They had their own platforms or whatever, but, but I just feel like having that survey at least you know, let the students know that we care. And I did look at, we did review them, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the women's, women's, um, women's uh, initiatives, women's issues, women initiatives mm -hmm. was something that was just getting off the ground when I was here. So I was trying to, rem I'm mm -hmm. trying to think of when, do you, do you remember a student named June Anderson? Yeah, the June okay. Anderson yeah. Center, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think she was, that I remember that her. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I sure do. In fact, her her office <laughs> was in the building, the Cape Keefley University Center. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I sure do. And we did not have the the type of representation of, of, of female faculty that reflected the student body. Or reflected the community. I mean, you could count the number of female um, professors, and some of them may have just been instructors, which meant that there was only a handful of, of full professors or associate professors. I mean, I think the June Anderson Center actually started maybe around 71 or two or three before I got here. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember them having speakers come here. I remember. Um, the June Anderson Center and the um, and Tommy Brown's office having some joint events. For example, they had Nikki Giovanni that came one year. Mm -hmm. So, and I remember, um, I remember there being a couple of different activities where, you know, you had this coalition between women's issues and the minority issues mm -hmm. because there's, I mean. Um, I think, you know, at least from from my short-sighted vantage point, there are a lot of shared fights and battle, battles. In some ways, some of the battles are unique 
but in many ways it's some shared territory. Right. Mm -hmm. And our cabinet reflected that, by the way. I mean, every, every, almost every one of my pre predecessors except Ted Helberg, from his all white male fraternity, you know, button down tie look. And, right. and I wasn't going to have that. I mean, our, I mean, the, the cabinet and our office, um, very diverse. When I, when I, you know, I, um, when student appointments were made, student appointments to student committees, mm -hmm. and I was surprised at the number of committees. Probably it's like maybe 150, something like that, different committees. And every last one of them required a student. Mm -hmm. I mean, a full voting student uh, as far as student representation. So I spent, I bet, a good part of, uh, you know, of, um, of what we call it intersection. They call it Maymester now. Okay, yeah. Uh, Maymester making appointments and trying to make sure that we had this diversity on, on, on these different committees. Um, do you know who the juvenile court judge here, here is mm -mm. in Nash, in uh, Davidson County, by the way? No. I'll just tell you she's a juvenile court judge. I appointed her to the to the food committee, the food service committee. Um, and not too long ago, she sent me a letter um, thanking me. Of course, she's I'm like, well, you're a judge now. This is a little <laughs> pincus, right? But she sent this letter thanking me for for um, for giving her that opportunity. And she also said she would not have eaten had she not been appointed to the committee because mm -hmm. the student on the committee is free free meals for the semester. Right. So, um, um, another thing that we uh, did was um, the university's first activity fee. Right. That was my brainchild. <laughs> it started out as a dollar, Sarah. It was just a dollar. I have no idea what it is now, but I'm sure it's not a dollar. Yeah. I think I, as a graduate student, so it might be different for undergrads. I think it's like three or four hundred dollars, maybe. It was only a dollar. <laughs> it was one dollar. We have you to thank for this. <laughs> yes, you have me to thank for this. <laughs> but it was also because the SGA, which funds student organizations, mm -hmm. always ran a shortfall. And the administration decided how much money the SGA got. So the different student government associations across the state got together and went to the state legislature and got some individuals that were members of the legislature to sponsor this bill. This is what state law. But it was also left up to each SGA legislative body to decide if they wanted it or not. For okay. example, I think like Tennessee Tech rejected it the first year or something like that. So even though it became law, there still was, you know, this autonomy that, as far as representation, people being able to, schools being able to decide if they wanted it or not. Uh, but a dollar was a lot back then. And there was, and I was surprised that students voted for it because it was a referendum. It wasn't like the student SGA House or Senate voted on it. It was a referendum. Mm -hmm. But it had to pass the SG House and Senate, and then I had to sign it in order for it to be a referendum, and they vote, students voted for it. So a dollar versus 300, can't imagine. <laughs> um, we had, um, um, I had an initiative to try to expand the um, health services office, um, and I got a lot of flack for that because the people who were running at the time took it as an affront. Mm -hmm. You know, we do a great job, and I was like, no, this is. I'm, I'm, I'm not being critical of what we have. We're just trying to build on what we got and do and and, and expand. But I mean, Sarah, I mean, I got pushback on that left and right, but eventually, I think the school saw that, you know students who are here on campus, um, if they have a medical emergency, may not be in a position to go to the emergency room. Um, 
and there's some preventative medicine or health care that can be provided that can kind of, you know, can kind of um, circumvent and, and, and prevent that. So I'd like to think that cooler heads prevail in that situation. And then also with the cost, it was cheaper for the university to do it. Um, and so, I mean, it took a while, but I think they eventually expanded the offices. But I did. I mean, I got flack for it because what I proposed was that we have a nurse on call 24 hours. Mm. Sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> well, I thought it was a good idea, too. But again, I mean, I got I got pushed back from it, Yeah. you know, for it. Um, one of the things I push, I mean, that I push for, and again, this is one of those discretionary trails that I use was the dormitories were relatively segregated to a great degree. One of the most segregated dorms was I dorm. I dorm was the athletic dorm. Okay. I don't know what it's called now. It was the athletic dorm. So that's where the majority of the athletes were housed, and most of them were African American. Um, you had very few blacks that were living in, you know, in uh, dormitories on a floor where there were whites, okay? And if there were, if you didn't have blacks and whites on the same floor, you'd have the whites on one end and the blacks on the other end. Uh, so, you know, I talked to the director of student housing and I said, you know, maybe we can't do it with this crop of students, but maybe as incoming students, you know, start to arrive, and I may not even be here. And come look at a plan where, you know, start to make this, you know, co-ethnic. You know, having blacks and whites rooming together. Mm -hmm. um, and to think that that was a big deal back in 78 or 79, but it, it was. Um, but believe it or not, um, they actually tried that with me. Putting you in a room with a, a white student? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it worked out for a while, and he just decided to to move off campus. So, but, but Sarah, you had that kind of, um, you know, de facto, you know, segregation existed. Um, and there's some other things, I don't know, we probably won't hear those, but, you know, there, there were some other initiatives that we took to, to try to improve race relations, try to improve the environment on campus for, for students of color. Um, we, we created uh, the first International Student Association. It was called SUN, S-U-N, Student mm -hmm. United Nations. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was the first international student association that we had on campus. Um, and that became a tool for, for African students. Mm -hmm. and because we had a lot of, you know, um, African students that were you know, on the track team and they felt isolated. And what we did was they, they participated in SUN, they participated in the SGA. Eventually, I mean, um, um, BSA eventually participated in the SGA. Mm -hmm. um, um, And there, and, I'm, and there, I'm sure there's some other things that that we did that don't come to mind now. Right. But um, my primary objective as president was to be inclusive, mm -hmm. was to try to improve the quality of life for all the students. But I always had in the back of my mind, you know, the job that I do, how I do it, how I'm perceived, how I talk how I act, how I walk, who I'm with, what we're doing, why are we doing it, why are we there, is being evaluated because I'm black. That was never, ever far from my mind. Um, it's just a reality. And like I said, this experience was a training ground because it's something I used when I became commissioner of elections in, in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had to you know, be aware of those same kind of you know, realities. 
Um, I did have members of the BSA come to me when I was president and ask me for things that I was not in a position to do. Um, and that was frustrating. Um, and I think that had more to do with the perception of the power that this office held, right? Right. Um, and, and that created frustration for me because this was my battle too. Um, um, and, and that was, that, that, that always hurt. And to some degree it still stings because it was a sense that, well, you're president now. You know, somehow you ought to be able to move these mountains. And, and, and my response would always be, well, you don't know how deep these roots are to this tree. And maybe just over time, you know, kind of, I mean, I mean, geology, my understanding is a study of time. Maybe it's not something that I can do within this incremental period of time that I'm here. But just like Sylvester and, and others, just like myself, gradually kind of build, you know, break these things down. Mm -hmm. um, but that was frustrating. It was like, a, you know, I'm not the Wizard of Oz. I can't do this. Right. Um, and then there was always, like I said, it was always um, this balancing act of, you know, are the white students going to perceive me as being too black? Or are the black students going to perceive me as not being black enough? My mom just settled that for me real quickly. Just, she said, you just be who you are. She said, you're the president and you just happen to be black. And you're going to always be black. You walk into a room, people are going to know you're black. That speaks before you even open your mouth. That's going to precede you no matter where you go. So, and she didn't use this word, but what she really meant was, Michael, you gotta be, grow to be comfortable in your skin. And, and I have, you can't, I'm not letting anybody validate me. And I will say that I know I've been very reserved up to this point, but I've got, I'm at a place in my life where I don't need validation. None of the things that I've done, it's not, they haven't validated me. They be maybe expressing what God wanted me to do. But my validation comes from something that's completely different. And to me, being black is part of that gift. It's, my, it's part of my uniqueness. Um, I mean, I don't wear it like a, I don't use it like a short sword or a shield. It is what it, what, what it is. Um, but at the same time, I recognize when I was president that there were black students who just felt like, well, you know, you ought to be able to do more. And, or you're not, you know, you're not who we thought you're going to be. But I heard that from me from the white students too. And you can't please everybody. Right. And that's you. You, you want to know the you want to know the the um, secret for failure. Try to please everybody. That's the secret for failure. So all I tried to do was the best job I knew how to do. Had one year to do the job. One year to learn it. Yeah. And by the time I learned it, it was time to go. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it sounds like you planted a lot of important seeds, at least. You accomplished some things and you planted some seeds for later. Like yeah. the Keefe University sent, like the forest black, because that didn't come down until 1989. Right. You started those conversations 10 years earlier. And that kind of shows that, that progression of time you were talking about, mm -hmm. slowly chipping away at things. I mean, and, and, and I would have preferred it had come down. I mean, just like the Berlin Wall. And, but look at what happened there, right? It didn't come down overnight, did it? You take the wall down. It took time for that wall to come down. Um, and I, I, I think for MTSU, in terms of like race relations, in the context of MT-68, um, there's been so many lost opportunities for growth. 
in terms of of inclusion. Um, and you know, we we've got African Americans that are in positions of influence that don't use that influence um, for whatever reasons, um, and they don't have the political will to do it. They like the political will uh, and the mental, the mental um, fiber and still to do it. Um, you make the decision, and if people get upset about it, they just learn to live with it. Um, so, and it's also a different political environment too compared to 68. I mean, I admire what those young people did, 68, 69, 70, 71. Um, and we've seen that here too in terms of the marches at Forest Hall and others. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, did you think that we were sitting here in 2018 and there still would be a Confederate symbol on this campus like Forest Hall? No. Mm -mm. Or, or the state legislature now seeking to pass laws to protect mm -hmm. these images? No. No. But Sarah, I remember and you were probably you you were a very young person I'm sure at this time in 1990 I wasn't even born you weren't even born <laughs> that's exactly right and this happened it actually said 99 I actually think it happened in 94 95 okay. the daughters of the confederacy mm -hmm. um, had gone to the, uh, the US Senate to get their um, um, trademark I think trademark renewed uh, some type of protective legal, you know, um, item. And um, there was a U.S. Senator, Carol Mosley Brown from Illinois, the first black female U.S. Uh, member of the U.S. Senate who objected to it. Um, you would have thought, you would have thought we'd be invaded by Mongolian whatever. You should have seen the pushback, but the so, but the idea that somehow the you know the DAR and the Sons of the Confederacy and all these other groups and maybe at some point in time we can talk about my work with the Southern Poverty Law Center SPLC, oh, yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, but the idea being that we still have these battles forty years later. Maybe part of me. Um, is is surprised, but maybe the other part is like, what did you expect? In some ways, we regressed. It's been regressive. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, you know, we don't have, we, and we don't have um, the the mascot, the Confederate mascot. I guess he wore blue. Maybe I'm sure. <laughs> his union mascot, however, yeah. on the horse, right, anymore. Um, uh, so, I mean, a lot of those remnants are gone in terms of, you know, maybe what we see on campus. But the mindset is still here. Right. I mean, there's the South and then there's the Old South. And this is the Old South. Um, they They like to think that they've connected tradition with tomorrow. But that has not happened. I mean, that's, that's, it's in most southern, southern cities, that's the ideology where tradition meets tomorrow. That's, that's a marketing tool because tradition um, overrules, you know, opportunities. Um, you know, I look at how a lot of the African American athletes were treated. I talk about this when I was SGA president. I had a, actually had an African, you know, a, a, a member of the basketball team, a friend of mine, African American, who had been told he had a scholarship to play on the team, uh, only to discover it was a Pell Grant. And so, um, I contacted the NCAA. You would have thought 
I bombed the place. But I saw something that was wrong. I wasn't getting any answers back from the university on it. But I knew who to contact. And guess what happened, Sarah? What do you think happened? Oh, he got a scholarship. Yeah. That's what I meant. There are things that we were able to do that maybe nobody's going to know about. It's not going to get pressed because you don't do it for that reason. But, the, you know, the just university, 40 years later, you know, pushes this metaphor that it's the beacon. And I don't see it that way. I just don't. It hurts me because I went to school. I got a degree from this place. Right. I have two degrees. I'm an associate's in law enforcement and my PS in political science. Got rid of the same day. Graduated with two degrees. I take pride in that. So when we protest, just like when Sylvester protests and others protested, um, it's not because we hate the place. It's because we love it. We want things to be better. We want our country to be better. We want, you know, as Americans, you know, we don't want to be known as ugly Americans. We want people to see us as being people who care, who want to make a difference. And what I'm just simply said is that the national platform is impacting what happens here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, there's no a license to hate, a license to, to oppress, License to disparage. Mm -hmm. yep. So, what this? You getting back to your original question? And I hush. No, I would never have thought we would we would be having this conversation. I wouldn't imagine Dr. King or Robert Bobby Kennedy would. Look at the strides that were made from literally from 64 64 to 72 64 Civil Rights Act of, of, uh, of uh, 64 65 the Voting Rights Act of 65 68 the Housing Act of 68 72 Title IX And there's some others I'm sure in there, but those four majors, and then Head Start, and all these other programs that were created to try to to try to address, you know, equality for women, to try to address equality for for children, to try to address equality for for the elderly and for people of color. And just in that timeline, and look at how much regression has happened within just the last 18 months. Yeah. Hmm? So, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Perhaps I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But, so, six, I mean, um, 78 to, to 2018. Um, and we have, we have more students of color on campus we had very few when I was here. That's the last thing I'll say. To me, I think that's important though because there was a coalition. We were there were so few of us, us that we had to, we had to, um, band together. Right. I'm sure Sylvester and Robert and others would say the same thing. I mean, we had to we had to be like a, you know, an army of ants. Um, um, and that created a certain sense of family and protection. Um, um, whereas we got more students, which is, I'm not saying it's bad, but probably um, densely populated now compared to how we were. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't, it, it can't be activists. I think the difference, though, is, is is that there may be many who say, well, you know what, 
this is not my battle. I'm here for this. And what they may not realize is um, they are here to make a difference beyond just getting a degree. Look at the student athletes who risk scholarships and playing time. Those are the sorts of things, like I said, I know about because I've had conversations with, with my friends that were, just continued to play when they got vocal and the coach sat them on the bench mm -hmm. or when they had a road game and, and they were told they were not going to be on the road team. I know about those things because they were black. Not all these things, like I said, were made public or are public. Right. Um, and even now, like I said, you've got more blacks on campus, um, and they've got more opportunities than we ever did, which means that they have more to lose than we do. And you would think that, and I would hope that, you know, they continue to fight the battle. I would hope that Dr. 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 McPhee, I'll just say this, I would just, I would just hope that I mean, he would understand the impact of some of these decisions. I'm just being, I'm just being candid about it. It's not a criticism, just an observation. Um, we're in a, piss, a position to, to really make a difference and be a flagship. Instead of the legislature leading us, we can lead them. We see what their agenda is. I don't know if you saw what their agenda is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, the school now has its own board, correct? Yes. Am I correct? Yes. And I'll just let that be it. Mm -hmm. I think it's, we should wrap up for today. Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you wanted, but. Oh, yeah. Okay. This has been great. Thank you so much. Okay.